So you're new to investing, or maybe not so new, but you find a lot of the terminology surrounding investments confusing. Well, we're going to start covering that topic in today's video. Hey, everybody, my name is Rob Berger. This is the Financial Freedom Show, where we talk about investing and particularly retirement. Uh, if that's of interest to you, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel. Also, I send out a newsletter every Sunday morning. You can subscribe to that newsletter in the link below the video. So this is the first of what I hope to be a series of videos where we talk about investing terminology, I think understanding what all the, the jargon means, and, and even more importantly, the concepts behind the, the jargon, I think can go a long way to, to making each of us more confident in our investing journey. And so we're going to start today. I've got seven, actually I've got a bonus term too. So I guess we're going to look at eight different terms uh, today, but these would be sort of foundational. If you already know all of these terms, but maybe you know someone who's new to investing, perhaps you can forward this video to them. All right, so let's get started. We want to begin with what stock is. You know, you, you hear someone say, I own stocks, or maybe they say, I own shares of a company. What, what does that mean? Well, it means that they are literally an owner, perhaps a part owner, of the company they own shares in. So if someone says, I own shares of Apple, well, they are a, a legal owner of Apple. Now, they, of course, they don't own the whole thing. They're, they probably own a very, very small percentage of Apple, but they are legally an owner of Apple and it entitles them to, for example, dividends. If the company pays out dividends, which is just a cash payment to the owners of, in this case, Apple, uh, they would be entitled to that. Of course, companies often take their profits, at least some of them, and reinvest them back into the company with the idea of growing the company and having even more profits and dividends in the future. And if you're a shareholder of a company, again, using Apple, as an example, you are a legal owner and you'll be entitled to those future dividends of the company. And again, they refer to that ownership as stock or sometimes uh, shares. Let me actually show you, if we go back in time, this is actually a stock certificate of shares from 1936. Of course, before computers, you know, an ownership of a company was represented with a, a stock certificate like the one you see here. And today, folks collect these. These become collectibles. Of course, everything is computerized today. And although shares and stocks, those terms are used interchangeably, technically they have slightly different meanings. You can see this is a single stock certificate, but it represents 100 shares. You can see that in the top corner there. And so that's the basic idea of if, if we said, you know, we own 10 shares, a natural question would be, oh, of which company? On the other hand, if we said we own 10 stocks, I think the assumption would be we own shares in 10 different companies. But again, stock, shares, uh, used interchangeably to refer to an investment as an owner of a company. You're investing in a company and you've become a part owner. Sort of a third term that can be used interchangeably would be equities, because as an owner, you have a claim on the equities of the, the equity of the company. And so someone might use that term as well, but stock, shares, equity, kind of all refer to being a part owner in a company. Now, I mentioned a bonus term. I want to talk about that now, and it's called the ticker. The ticker is uh, a series of letters, unique letters that describe, in this case, each stock. They, they also describe other investments that we'll get to in a minute, but each individual company, think Microsoft or Exxon or Apple, they have their unique tickers. And in fact, I can show you an example of one. We'll just go to Apple. I'm in uh, uh, Morningstar, morningstar.com. It's just a way, a place where you can go and research different investments. And you can see right here, AAPL, that is the unique ticker for Apple. No other company has that ticker. No other investment, just Apple. And uh, you may wonder, well, where in the world does the word ticker come from? Well, back in the day, they used these ticker tapes. These, this was a machine uh, that, that uh, was actually uh, repurposed specifically to print out uh, shares, uh, the, the stocks and their prices. Before this, uh, you got information on, on a company's price, usually by messenger or mail, but in the 1860s, a fellow by the name of Callahan, in fact, we can even go to history.com for, for you, you that are interested in this. I will uh, throw a link below the video for this. But this guy named Edward Callahan, he's right here. He actually took a telegraph machine and sort of reconfigured it so that it would print out stock prices. And the word ticker came from the noise that this typed machine made as it sort of ticked along. 
And it's also, by the way, where we get ticker tape parades from, uh, I think most of the time in New York uh, City. But I mentioned the, the reason I talk about the, the, the term ticker is because it'll be an important, once you know the ticker of, say, a stock, for example, you can then use that to find information about the company and research it like I showed you just a second ago in uh, Morningstar. And we'll come back to ticker in, in just a minute. All right. The next term are, are bonds. So this would be, uh, think of yourself as a banker. If you buy a bond, you are effectively lending money, typically either to a government like the U.S. government or a corporation. We'll go back to Apple. Apple has sold bonds into the public market. And if you were to buy one of those, you would effectively be lending money to Apple. And the word bond is significant. If we, if we go out of the realm of finance, we think about a bond, it's sort of like a contractual commitment. You know, you're making a bond with someone. That's not something to be broken, right? And that's really the idea behind a bond, because when you uh, invest in a bond, uh, there is a contractual obligation for the borrower to pay the interest on the money they've borrowed from you at whatever the agreed upon rate is and to return your money when the bond matures. And so if you were to invest in a, a U.S. Treasury bond issued by our government, that's a contractual obligation on the part of our government. They've got to pay whatever interest they promise to pay and uh, return your money when the term of the bond uh, ends. Now, I'll throw in an extra term that's fixed income. Often bonds and fixed income are used interchangeably. Uh, the idea of fixed income is that most bonds, not all of them, but most of them have a fixed rate of interest, uh, but those can be used interchangeably. But notice the difference. With, with stocks, there's, of course, no guarantee that the company will do well, that will continue to pay dividends, uh, and there's certainly no contractual obligation. If, if the company didn't do well and went out of business, unless there was some fraud involved, you wouldn't have a legal claim. You couldn't sue the company and say, wait, wait, wait a minute. I want my dividend, please. It's not a contractual obligation in that regard. On the other hand, with a bond, if the borrower uh, refused to pay, you could sue. Now, if they've gone completely out of business, that's a different issue. You could sue. You might even win, but you might not collect. But the point is that with a bond, there's this contractual obligation between you, the lender, and the government or corporate entity that's borrowing the money. So that's a bond. And that gets to a big question now, and to our next term, is uh, mutual fund. And with a mutual fund, the question that a mutual fund is designed to try to solve is this. What stocks or bonds, or, or both perhaps, should we invest in? Do we have to go out on our own, pick individual stocks, pick individual bonds to try to create some sort of investment portfolio for ourselves? Well, the idea of a mutual fund is, no, you don't. We'll let the mutual fund do it. We can invest in a single mutual fund, and that mutual fund will go out and invest in what could be hundreds, even thousands of stocks or even thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of bonds for us. All we have to do is invest in a single mutual fund and that mutual fund takes care of the rest. So the idea of a mutual fund is to make investing and making uh, uh, diversified investing where we can spread our money across literally thousands of stocks and bonds extremely easy. Now, just like stocks, mutual funds have a unique ticker. They're typically five letters long, and I'll show you an example. For this example, we're going back to Morningstar, and we're looking at the Vanguard Wellington Fund, and we can see here's the ticker, VWELX, and uh, it is one of the oldest mutual funds. I think it was, if I remember correctly, was founded or launched in 1929, so it's almost 100 years uh, old, and uh, and uh, it invests in thousands of, of stocks and bonds. In fact, we can in Morningstar go to the portfolio, this link here, and we can come down and we can actually see what it invests in to a large degree. So this tells us that it, it invests in 80. Notice it says equity. Remember, we know that, what that means. That's a stock, a share, equity used interchangeably. So it's investing in 80 companies, uh, the stock of 80 companies. And bond holding, just over 1,200. So in this single fund, we're getting exposure to the, the, the stocks of 80 companies and uh, over 1,200 different bonds, all from just investing in this one mutual fund with ticker VWELX. And 
Uh, from this, we can we can think of mutual funds into in at least initially into three categories. There are stock mutual funds where all they invest in are, are stocks. There are bond or fixed income mutual funds, all they invest in are bonds. And then there are what, what are called balanced mutual funds. Uh, that would be an example, Wellington, that we just looked at that invests in both stocks and bonds. So there you go. That's what a mutual fund is. And it's also the kind of investment you'll likely see inside your workplace retirement account. 401k, 403b, perhaps you're at the TSP. If you're a U.S. government employee, uh, you will see mutual funds. Now, the next term we need to understand is called exchange traded fund or ETF. And as a practical matter, an exchange traded fund is very similar to a mutual fund. It, through one investment, you, it, they can spread your money across thousands of stocks, thousands of bonds, or both, right? So just like there are stock mutual funds, bond mutual funds, and balanced mutual funds, you guessed it, there are stock ETFs, bond ETFs, and balanced ETFs. We'll look at uh, some examples in a minute, but it does raise the question, well, if we've got mutual funds and they make investing really simple, why do we need exchange-traded funds? Well, for long-term investors, as a practical matter, uh, the difference may not be all that meaningful. But here's, here's the key difference. When you buy a mutual fund, like Wellington we looked at, you're buying the shares from the mutual fund company. And when you sell, you're selling back to the mutual fund company. With an exchange-traded fund, that's not how it works. When you buy and sell, you're buying and selling with other investors. So does it really matter? Well, there can be some tax advantages to some ETFs as compared to some mutual funds. So if you're investing in a taxable account, it may matter. And there are some other complications and things to understand about exchange-traded funds, which we'll cover in a future video. But at a high level, both a mutual fund and an ETF are designed to do the same thing, make it really easy to invest in a diversified portfolio of stocks, bonds, or both, and let me show you an example. We'll take a look at uh, this mutual fund. So this is a VFIAX. Again, that's the ticker. And it's a Vanguard 500 Index Admiral Fund. We'll talk about what this means in a minute. But this is a mutual fund. If we go to the portfolio, we can see that it invests in stocks. Right here, equities, right? Just over 500. It doesn't invest in any bonds. So this is an example of a bond uh, excuse me, a stock mutual fund. Now, we can get the, the almost identical investment in an ETF, and here it is. It's issued by Vanguard. It's just an ETF. You'll notice that the ticker is just has three letters, which is common in a, in a lot of ETFs. Uh, it's VOO. It invests in the exact same thing. We can go to the portfolio, scroll down, see the same, same 503 companies. Uh, no bonds. It's just an ETF version of this mutual fund, right? And so uh, for a lot of folks, the distinction between mutual fund and ETF is not all that important. There can be some very limited, as I said, circumstances where maybe it matters. We'll talk about those in a, a future video. Now, with mutual funds and exchange traded funds, now that we understand what they are, it raises, I think, a big question. How do the mutual fund companies or the exchange traded fund companies decide what stocks to invest in or what bonds to invest in? How do they make that decision? And there are actually sort of two general approaches. And the first would be they hire a lot of people with fancy college degrees to sit there and evaluate all of the stocks and all of the bonds and, and try to pick what they think are the best possible investments and invest in those uh, companies and, and bonds. That, that kind of investment is referred to as actively managed, an actively managed mutual fund or an actively managed ETF. The idea being that there are folks actively trying to pick the best investments. Now, if you're new to investing, you might think, well, that sounds like, yeah, that's how they should do it, right? I mean, how else would they do it, right? Well, it turns out that there's another approach. They call it passive investing or index fund investing. And the idea is, we're not gonna hire all these folks with fancy degrees. Uh, what we're gonna do is pick stocks or bonds, or in, a, in the case of a balanced fund, both, based on some index, some already sort of agreed upon group of companies. So we don't need to pay the salaries for all these people to do all this evaluation. We'll just track the index. Perhaps the most famous index 
is the S&P 500. We were actually looking at it when we were looking at these Vanguard mutual funds and, and the ETF version. This is the mutual fund version. Vanguard 500, the 500 refers to the S&P uh, 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 500, that index of, of roughly 500 of, of some of the largest companies in the United States. So this fund doesn't have to pay a lot of, uh, of salary to, to folks to evaluate, in this case, stocks. They're just going to track the S&P 500. Now, given that, it raises a big question. Well, what's the better approach? I mean, should I pay someone to, for an active fund that's going to spend a lot of money to, to try to pick the best investments, or should I just track an index? And that actually, that question actually gets us to the, the last term we're going to cover today, and it's related very closely to that question between, should I go with an index fund or an actively managed fund? And that is the expense ratio. Mutual funds and ETFs, with a few minor exceptions, aren't free. We pay a fee for them, and that fee is referred to as the expense ratio. Expense simply being, you know, the cost that we, we as investors have to pay. The reason it's called a ratio, it's like, well, why do we have to get all fancy? Why can't we just call it the cost of the mutual fund? They call it a ratio because the, these expenses uh, are determined based on a percentage of the amount you have invested. So, for example, if you have $100,000 in a mutual fund and its expense ratio is 1%, well, 1% of $100,000 comes out to a 1000 bucks. That's the fee you would pay each and every year for that fund. And of course, as your balance in that fund goes up, so would your expenses, because it's always, in this case, 1%. And of course, maybe the market went down, you'd pay less if it went below $100,000. But the key point is, whatever the expense ratio is of a fund, that's going to get multiplied against uh, how much you have invested in that fund. And that's what you're going to have to pay each year for expenses. And why does that matter when we talk about index funds versus actively managed funds? Here's why. Index funds, by and large, are significantly less expensive than actively managed funds. So let me show you. We'll, go, we'll just use the same Vanguard 500 uh, index mutual fund. If we go to the quote page here, we can see uh, that its expense ratio is right here. Here's the term expense ratio. It's just 0.04%. So they would call that four basis points. Uh, basis points is another good term to know. 100 basis points would equal 1%. This is just charging four basis points. It's really just a fraction uh, of 1%. Uh, the, the expense of this fund, it's almost not even worth factoring in. It's so inexpensive. By the way, the ETF version is even cheaper. It's three basis points. So these are very expensive funds. Now let's go back to our, our, our Vanguard Wellington. Historically, by the way, this has been an excellent fund, but it is an actively managed fund. It's not an index fund. And if we go to the quote page, we can see it's more expensive. It's 24 basis points. Now here's the thing. As an actively managed fund, 24 basis points is extremely inexpensive. Most actively managed funds cost 1% or more. And it helps us understand how to proceed when we want to decide between an index fund and an actively managed fund. In my view, with some perhaps except exceptions like Wellington, the vast majority of the time, index funds are going to outperform actively managed funds. The data tells us that. If we look over a five or certainly 10 year period, there are very, very, very few actively managed funds that outperform their equivalent index fund. Why? Well, there are a number of reasons for it, but probably the biggest reason are costs. Actively managed funds, as I said, charge 1% or more in most cases. That's a big fee. So in order for that fund to even match an index fund, they've got to outperform it by the amount of their fees. And if that's 1% or even higher, that's extremely difficult to do. And the reality is, we know from the data, actively managed funds over long periods of time simply can't do it. So there you go. If you've listened all the way to the end here, well, thank you. I appreciate it. I do think understanding these terms and the concepts behind them uh, are really important. It can, make, it can give you a, a greater sense of confidence as you make in investing decisions for yourself and your family. Again, 
This is just the start of what is going to be a series of videos on investing terms. We'll, we'll dive into a lot more detail on stock-related terms, bond-related terms, talked about ETFs, and so on. So again, if you find this information helpful, please subscribe to the channel. Also, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below this video. I'll do my best to help you out any way I can. And until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.